I'm a caver. Yesterday on my exploration I found a disturbing letter that halted our expedition. Submitted by Mouse Curtains. A little bit of background context for you all. I'm a 27 year old male, and I've been caving pretty much since I was 17. I'm no expert, but I enjoy the sport and exploration. Where some might find shuffling through cramped spaces in near pitch black save for a head torch horrific, I find it exhilarating. Recently, my friend Mark, a fellow caver and my best friend from college, came to me to tell me of a cave nearby that he'd seen whilst exploring another cave. It looked interesting, to say the least. So yesterday, we packed up all our gear and drove to it, 50 miles up into the mountains. When we arrived, I noticed what had caught Mark's eye about it. The entrance showed that the cave traveled steeply upwards, almost vertically, a wide enough space for both of us to climb side by side rather than one behind the other. We quickly got to work attaching harnesses and preparing to ascend up the interior, when we noticed little carved out ledges in the cave wall, going upwards like a little ladder of sorts. This truly piqued our curiosity, and we began to ascend using the carved out steps for guidance. That was all fine until around 10 steps up, I noticed a folded wedge of papers stuffed into one of the ledges. After convincing Mark to turn back down so we could read them, I began to recant the writings of what may be a madman, or something far more horrifyingly real. It was a four-page letter, with writing scrawled all over it, dampened from its time in the cave. Regardless, it stopped us from exploring. Below I have typed out word for word what was written on the pages. Make of it what you will, but it is disturbing, nonetheless. Dear to whomever it may concern. I think that's the phrase, anyway. I must warn you of the dangers you are about to encounter. I beg of you, do not ascend the steps. You are in grave danger. Turn away now. Turn away now before IT smells you. I will tell you my story, if you find it hard to validate my warning. Be warned, it would be best to stop reading altogether and turn home now. However, I know many of you will be too stubborn to heed my warnings. Thus, I must recount the series of events leading up to the terrible fate of myself and many others. The year is 2193. Humanity has almost been wiped out, save for some small knit communities that have managed to preserve themselves. I belong to one of those communities. We are not advised to leave the commune, but of course, teenagers and young adults such as myself live to tickle our curiosity. So we explored the mountains. The journey to the mountains is very dangerous. There are pools of chemical waste and barren, sunken lands that collapse underneath your feet should you take the wrong step. My friends and I are clever though, and have been raised on the broken earth to be wary of such dangers. The journey was perilous, but not for us. We were a group of six. Myself, female, with another female and four males. Our ages ranged between 14 to 21. The cave you, my dear, unsuspecting reader, are currently standing in, was the last thing we ever got to explore. Our young, unfulfilled lives snuffed out by making the mistake of satisfying our thirst for adventure. Once again, I will tell you firmly. Get out of here if you want to live happily. When we finally arrived at the cave, we noticed its ascending tunnel was carved into with little steps. Ledges for our feet and hands to help us climb up the near sheer wall. We ascended them. My friends were so excited, chattering with joy as we grew closer and closer to the top of the tunnel, approaching a wide ledge that led to flat ground for us to walk on. I, however, grew increasingly nervous. There was something not quite right sitting in the pit of my stomach. I would later learn that this was the primitive instinct of feeling preyed upon. As we got to the top of the ledge, we found a wide cavern filled with light, the light source of which was unknown. The moment I saw the light, I felt pure fear. But I proceeded onwards anyway. As we moved into the cavern, we saw the impossible. It was a large arena-sized circular room, filled with different segments of themed spaces. To elaborate, imagine cutting an orange in half. You see each equal size segments sitting next to each other, with a line of pith separating each segment from the next. Well. This was like the set out of the room. Each segment had a different theme to it, separated from the next by a different color of paint on the cave walls. For example, one segment was World Atlas themed, with a large globe on a stand sitting in the middle of the segment, with the walls painted blue. Another segment was Dolls themed, the walls painted a pastel pink with a mound of pincushion dollies piled in the center. As my friends stared in awe, I began to feel increasingly nauseous, and told my friends I had to go back down the tunnel and outside for some fresh air. Timothy, a boy in our group who I knew, had a certain fondness for me, offered to come outside with me. My friends announced that, after a bit more exploration, they would come back down to tell us what they found. 
we then parted ways. Exiting the cavern, Timothy descended the steps first, supporting me as I descended after him. Just as we got near to the bottom, however, I felt something truly chilling. The movement of air just millimeters above my scalp. I recognized it instantly as the swooping motion of a hand, swinging to grab at the hair on my head. I squealed and fell back, bringing Timothy down with me too. I quickly clambered back up, and ran out of the cave entrance, Timothy on my heels asking me what had startled me so much. I explained to him what had happened, and he simply brushed it off as nerves, which comforted me in some respects, but also annoyed me slightly that he wouldn't take my words seriously. No more than 10 minutes after we had reached the exterior of the cave, did the rest of my friends join us. All four of them, smiling gleefully about their findings. It unnerved me greatly. They explained how, at the other end of the cavern, there was a small door just wide enough for them all to crawl through on their hands and knees. It was a little red door, hidden behind a large teddy bear that made the red segment of the room teddy bear themed. On the other side of this door, was a living room. It was immaculately clean, apparently with sofas made out of white satin, and even contained something known as a television, a historical artifact that allowed pre-Great War humans to enjoy worldwide entertainment on a broadcasted screen. There were other rooms too, a kitchen, with a refrigerator full of delights, such as a large chocolate fudge cake, fresh fruit, a rarity in these times, steaks, the lot. There were bedrooms with fresh bedding, and bathrooms with bathing tubs large enough to fit all six of us in, should we want. I began to wonder how they could have found all of that in under 15 minutes. I reasoned that the adrenaline from exploring such a fantastical thing must have rushed them. I was so wrong. So, so wrong. As they described the house inside the cave, their grins grew wider and wider, unnervingly so. They were so happy to have found this place. So very happy. They urged me to come look, begging me to join them in the fun. I firmly said no. Something was not right with that place. Nothing in the history books we had discovered ever told us of caves that contained rooms and fresh food. It wasn't normal, nor natural for a cave to be kept like a home. I told them I would be staying outside. I would wait for them here. Timothy stated he'd keep me company. The last image in my mind of all my friends alive was of them all ascending up the ledges, eyes wide and unblinking. Still smiling. We waited for them for almost 10 hours. At least, I had thought it was 10 hours. I couldn't tell as my clock piece had frozen in place by the time we entered the cave. As it grew darker and darker and the sun set over the land, we heard shuffling down the cave tunnel. I froze, and Timothy turned to look. He greeted whoever it was, and only one of our friends could be seen. The rest had not followed him. It was the oldest of our group, Harrison, who was stood at the bottom of the tunnel, breathing heavily and erratically. With a hoarse voice, he screeched run, and bolted towards us, and away down the paths leading back to our home. Without hesitating, we followed in pursuit. I knew in that moment that I couldn't look behind me, that if I did, I would see whatever hellish creature nearly grabbed me hours earlier. We did not stop running until we arrived back at the commune. I felt as though my lungs might collapse, and we fell into a nearby park space to rest. Harrison had tears streaming down his cheeks, his eyes fixed and unwavering. His face was disheveled, hairs grew on his chin and neck, his hair longer and ragged. He had large purple circles around his eyes, showing a dangerous lack of sleep. He described what had happened to the others. He stated that they had been in the cave for three weeks, at least, but he had no idea how long it had actually been as there were no clocks in the rooms, and his clock piece had stopped working. At first, they were extremely content, the food was delicious, and they had fresh running water. The television device played old-fashioned pictures that spoke and move, and sometimes played music that they had never heard of. At one point, they had all unanimously decided that they would never leave. Their memories of their lives outside of the cave started to fade, and all they could feel was overwhelming happiness. That was, until one morning, when Harrison woke up, and everything was different. The painted pastel walls were no more. Instead, red blood smeared the cave. The bathing tub was a basin full of rotting meat, and the air that once smelled fresh and clean was bloodied and deceased, and sulfur filled his nose and throat until he vomited. As he screamed for the others, he noticed that the television screen was just a sheet of human skin that had been stretched and pinned over the wall. The foods in the refrigerator were rotting piles of brain and bone. But most disturbingly of all, our friends, his companions for what felt like the past three weeks, were mere skeletons sat at the kitchen table. He had been talking to corpses for at least the past few days now. And that's when he heard it. The slithering of skin on rock, the clacking of claws on the walls. 
the sickening dragging of a limp body that had adapted to live in the shadows for centuries. He turned, and he saw it. On the cave, the ceiling was a humanoid figure. Sickly cream colored, with skin loosely covering disjointed limbs that clasped to the rock. Its fingers were long and spindly, and covered in brown, dried blood. Its eyes had no lids, nor irises, and were bloodshot red, with black pupils resting in the center. It had no nose, but a wide, horrific grin that stretched over sharp, uneven black teeth. It scuttled to slightly above him, red saliva dripping onto his face. It said to him. Do you like my home, I made it just for you. Harrison then ran out and almost leapt down the tunnel. The whole time he could hear the thing scuttling after him. After telling us his story, he vomited. We took him home, and then told the authority group about our missing friends and our experiences. They said they'd have a look at the caves for us. We were not reprimanded by our parents, but they did inform us that it would be inappropriate to continue talking about the cave. For many nights after the day at the cave, I have been plagued with night terrors. Dreams of waking up in the cave rooms, dreams of waking up to the realization that what I thought was reality in the commune was simply a hallucination caused by the creature in the cave. Dreams that the creature was stood over me, waiting for me to wake up. A week had gone by when the commune May Day celebrations took place. I was depressed, I couldn't eat nor sleep. Harrison hadn't left his home once, and Timothy was in the same state as myself, unable to sleep from the fearful night terrors that made him restless. I couldn't stand it. Everyone in the commune knew what had happened to us. They had done nothing. Even my deceased friend's parents were smiling and laughing. Laughing like buffoons when the bones of their children had been picked clean by some mutant. The next thing I knew, I screamed. I stood up and screamed at the adults, the authority group. I asked them how they could be so gleeful when there were dead children at unrest in the cave. That's when the authority group took me away. I was strapped to a chair. They told me I was suffering hysteria, and the land outside the commune had high levels of ammonia that caused myself and my friends to hallucinate. It had caused permanent brain damage. I was suffering from fits, and my mind had convinced myself that I was simply imagining things. I had made it all up on some chemical high with my friends. They had simply been unable to make it back to the commune. It was a perilous journey, after all. Until tonight, I have spent every minute in my home, trying to make sense of all the events that had led up to now. Had I really been hallucinating? My entire concept of reality was skewed. It was so vivid to me, the caves, the journey, the fear in Harrison's face. The fact that my clock piece had stopped working. My clock piece had stopped working. My clock piece had stopped working. I jumped up out of my bed and began to write this all down in a letter to you, dear reader. The point of this all is, my clock piece had stopped working. So had Harrison's, as he entered the cave. And now, I realize with ultimate fear in my heart, that none of the clocks in my town work either. As I am writing this down, I feel a familiar sense of dread. In the corner of my eye, blood is smeared on my walls. My walls are no longer wooden, but rock. I feel sick. I feel sick my clock piece has stopped working I feel sick my clock piece has stopped working I feel sick my clock piece has stopped working. Note, this rambling goes on for a whole page. I am going back to the cave. I am no longer in my world. I am not home. This is not home. I pray you to turn back as I have told you to. Time does not exist. Everything is hell. It wants you to come. I do not know whether reality is actually what it has just revealed to me, or if reality is on the other side of the cave. I do not know what reality is. I do not know what time is. It has altered my reality. I am going back to the cave to ask if I can pretend again. I want to go and pretend that reality isn't this. I don't know if reality is that I am suffering hallucinations from brain damage, or if reality is the hallucinations itself, or if it is neither. I do not know anymore. But before I go, I will leave you this letter. If you want to continue to explore, be my guest. I cannot stop you as I have handed my fate over to it. Time does not exist. Reality is altered. If you enter, the world you exist in now will not be the same world as when you exit, should it let you exit. The decision is yours, dear reader. Would you rather be ignorant and happy, unaware of your slow demise, or would you try to find the truth of the cave dwelling monstrosity, but be conscious of every dreadful thing that surrounds you? Signed, Ophelia. Safe to say, Mark and I decided not to explore the cave that day. I personally didn't feel there was anything wrong with the cave, although the letter did disturb me a bit. I didn't feel like climbing up the ledges to find the dead body or something of a crazy person lying at the top. But. Something has stuck with me. 
This concept of reality being altered. The idea that what we think we are seeing is just some huge lodge. Freaky, right? I can't really make sense of the letter. It feels like the unfinished premise to a Stephen King fantasy horror novel. Regardless, I don't want to explore the cave to find out if it's true or not, lol. By the way, does anyone know what time Chicago Fire comes on tonight on NBC? My TV isn't displaying the time right now.